Hey guys, so this is my segment where I took the chronological time frame and made it more narrative. This is the portion that I call his story. Okay. With the European commercial revolution, Europe began to change in nature. As the population increased, so did the, man so did the demand for supplies. Standards of living increased and traders looked for new markets. At this time, Europe's trade with Asia was prominent, but Europe wanted to find faster ways to Asia. The routes to Asia were dominated by the Italians, and travel was dangerous. At the time, Asia wanted weapons, and Europe wanted silks and spices. Pepper was especially important, as it made the taste of meat that was not so that meat that was not considered so fresh. As navigation technology developed, it allowed ships to deviate further from shore. Latitude was discovered in 1450, but it wasn't for another 300 years that longitude would be discovered. Ships used to stay close to shore. Their poor technologies and build made it hazardous to venture away from shore and to take a more direct route. As ships, as ships changed in design, the hulls went from clinker to carvel, the sails went from wool to cotton, and the masts went from single to triple. Travel times became shorter, routes became more direct, and labor costs on the ships decreased. Just as capitalism is dominant today, mercantilism dominated back in the 1450s. Mercantilism is an economy of high exports, low imports, and the health, wealth, and power of an economy is measured by bullionism. The economy would import little raw material and export high amounts of finished products. Mercantilism was hugely successful at the time because there were few capitalistic states. Today, mercantilism is not so popular. Rather, today, capitalism is the complete 180 of mercantilism. Raw materials are exported to be processed abroad by cheap labor and imported back for final sale, as is today. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In 1493, Columbus ravages and robs the Aztecs of their gold. Spain was so successful with their early explorations, the British started thinking that they could do the same. The British sent, sent John Cabot to find a more direct route to Asia and make trade with Asia quicker, safer, and more profitable. The British had no such luck. Cabot only discovered fish. John Cabot discovered Newfoundland in 1497 and founded the Grand Banks. Newfoundland would now become a crucial part of Britain's economy in the years to come. Cod was the item of interest, and it may have been scarce in Europe, but it definitely was in a surplus in Newfoundland. The fishing was first all done from boats. British fishing ships would come over, catch the cod, and use a technique called green curing. This technique heavily depended on salt to preserve the fish. The fish would be caught, gutted, cleaned, salted, and re-salted. Fishing was done from winter to May and depended heavily on spawning habits of cod. When the cod migrated to deeper waters, the fishing ships would return, as they could not go too far inshore. At the time, it was customary that the, that the first captain to arrive in the area would have territorial jurisdiction. The first ship on site would also have the best catch. As competition intensified, ships came earlier and earlier every year. As a result, smaller boats would come closer into land to do the fishing. This resulted in inshore fishing, but these inshore fishermen needed to preserve the product as well. Inshore fishermen did not green cure. They could dry cure. Dry curing was a process that used flakes, the sun, and smaller amounts of salt. Dry curing had a lower cost, had a better taste, and required less salt to be brought over on the ships. The dry cure did not require, did require timber for flakes, and this led to inshore exploration. Fishing at the time was characterized by high costs and high risks. The boats were expensive, labor was intensive, 
and sailing across open waters presented itself to the perils of the sea, such as pirates, wars, and storms. At the time, marine insurance was rare and very expensive. Profits were dependent on the size of the catch, and the price set for the catch depended on market price variability. Sometimes there would be a surplus in cod, sometimes not. Captains also did not want to be selling their catch to the market at the time when everybody else was, because a surplus in the market meant a lower price and lower profits. Captains would then want to be returning later than everyone else. Merchants also wanted their slice of the pie, so they would charter sack ships to bring back the surplus cod and sell it for a higher price. The market for British cod was France and Portugal. These two areas had a large Roman Catholic population and cod was very popular because these groups had religious restrictions on eating meat and their agriculture was under development. But the French were geographically closer to Newfoundland so they began to fish as well. But the British dominated in the long run. The French fished off the shores of Iceland and the Danish started taking power over Icelandic waters. The British were forced out. But cod was not the only hot topic in the early 1500s. Beaver fur was also a hot item. The inner coat of, of beaver fur was used to make felt hats. As fashion changed and wider brims became the style at the time, Russia's beaver supply was over harvested. The price, increase, the, the price increase was perfect at the time for North America. The French, though, were useless at trapping, so they turned to the natives to help trap beavers. The next 250 years, European expansion was because of fur. In 1535, Jack Cartier sailed up the St. Lawrence to visit two Aboriginal settlements. These were Stadacoma and Hachalega, now Quebec City and Montreal, respectively. By 1550, the French began to bring back the first furs to France. By the 1600s, fisheries began to formally develop and settlement began in Acadia, which was mostly farming. England, England, became, a metro, uh, England became a metropolis and Newfoundland was its hinterland. Newfoundland would send their staples to England and send supplies. In 1608, Champlain arrived at the St. Lawrence, erected a habitation at Quebec City, and made an alliance with the Huron tribe. Champlain wanted to create strong bonds with the Huron, so he invaded the Iroquois with the Huron, not a wise move on behalf of Champlain. By 1610, the British had displaced the French from the Avalon Peninsula and displaced the Portuguese from fishing off Newfoundland. By 1613, the Dutch established New Amsterdam, which now is New York City, and allied with the Iroquois, which Champlain had raided five years earlier. This was the beginning of a 30-year battle of the Huron and the Iroquois. The fur trade had very volatile demand and supply. The market was wealth dependent. Demand was dependent on fashion. If Europe was doing well, the demand for hats increased. European merchants at the time wanted control, so they began to bargain for exclusive rights to fur trade so they could control the amount of fur coming into Europe. The problem of this was enforcement. Anyone with a canoe could trap and trade, so trade could not be controlled. As trappers had to expand over larger and larger areas of land, supplies were used up quickly and the farther west they traveled, the higher the costs were. Fur was a high value and low bulk commodity, and the cost did not come from travel expenses. As fur trade expanded further west, the use of river systems became more important, and with Canada's two million rivers, this was the transportation method of choice. Birch bark canoes were used for transporting fur. In the mid-1600s, many by boat keepers could not afford to buy shares in ships, so they would send workers to Newfoundland to settle and fish for the summer months, and then the workers would come back for the off-season. But not all workers came back. Some settled and stayed. The fish caught by these laborers were sold to sack ships and brought back to Europe. In 1632, the Western Charter was passed, 
With the colonization of the Avalon Peninsula and the development of inshore fisheries, the ship captains were no longer the first on site to gain governance. 1632, Britain amended territorial jurisdiction with, with the Western Charter. Britain attempted to colonize Newfoundland multiple times, but failed due to, due to the lack of women and children that were in Newfoundland. The British liked the idea of settlement, but also liked the idea of migratory fishing. They liked the idea of settlement because it meant France could not approach upon the territory. But they also liked the idea of migratory fishing because it was good training for the Navy. In 1651, Britain decreed the Navigation Act. This act determined that no ships could, could be used in transporting goods between Britain and the colonies. Or, this act determined that no ships used in transporting goods between Britain and the colonies could be non-British. The goal of this was to stop the colonies from trading with territories other than Britain. In 1663, the Staples Act declared England an entrepot for re-export of all goods passing through and en route to and between Europe and the colonies. In the 1660s, New France was expanding, and changes in the colony began. The entry of the Courier de Bois made, independent, made independence the fur traders of choice and no longer the natives. With the, with the independence, it became difficult to regulate the supply of fur coming into Europe. By 1680, there were so many independents, the Courier de Bois, even the merchants began to hire them to bring back furs. By 1663, France gives up the idea of a fur monopoly and instead made New France a royal colony. The head of the colony was Colbert. France, in the short one, supported the emergence of the colony and subsidized immigration of women and children. As the population grew, there was diversification out of fur linkages. Colbert wanted to integrate New France into the French colony and advocated mercantilism. But by 1670, France began losing enthusiasm for the colony. In 1699, we see the Newfoundland Act. This act was more concerned with fishing rights and the appointment of jurisdiction than with the settlers. The charter gave the ship, ship admirals governance of the land and naval captains territorial jurisdiction over the land. This charter greatly favored the British fishing merchants. Settlement of Newfoundland was allowed as long as it did not interfere with migratory fishing. By 1729, we begin to see some settlement, some settlement growth in Newfoundland. Settlement in Newfoundland was slow, the land was isolated, the weather was harsh, and the winters were long. Well, they are long. The land had little potential for agriculture, and settlers had to import food. There was not much economic potential beyond fishing. Well, there still really isn't. By the next year, the fisheries had expanded and the French were excluded from the vicinity by the Treaty of Utrecht. The Treaty of Utrecht helped end the war of the Spanish succession, of, uh, officialized France's loss of Acadia, France gave up Camp, Cape Breton to the British, and the French recognized Britain's claim over the Hudson's Bay area. As colonization grew in Newfoundland, Migratory fishing became less and less, uh, made less and less sense, and the fishermen became braver and braver and ventured further away from the shore. In 